Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Our special guest is a guitarist, a songwriter, a singer, and recording artist. Tab Levin. Thank you so much hello, for joining hello. us. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I think most stories are best from the beginning. Tell us about the music that you appreciated as a young person. Pretty much like everybody else of my generation, the Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, James Taylor. That's kind of what I grew up on. That's how I learned how to play guitar as a 12, 13-year-old kid, you know, listening to records and lifting the needle up and putting it back down and just until the records were no good anymore, just went over and over and learning the guitar parts, you know. Didn't really even know how to tune the guitar properly, I don't think, when I first started, but eventually I figured it out. That's how I learned how to play guitar, just by ear. And that's kind of how I still play guitar, just by ear. I don't really read music except chord charts I can do, but as far as actual music, I don't do. So I've just developed a good ear to be able to pick up things quickly. And that's how I do it. But but pretty much just those, just kind of the, the regular guys and women back there, Joni Mitchell, she was a little bit later, I think. But, but just that kind of that folk rock era was my thing back then. And when did you start to write your own songs? I've been building it over the years. I mean, kind of when I first started playing guitar, I would write simple little songs and and just kind of throughout the years, nothing very serious, but just... And when I decided to get very serious about it, I I looked towards Nashville. I'd been down to Nashville in a band that I was in. We were actually signed to Warner Brothers for a brief moment in time. But being in Nashville, which is where I live now, but in Minneapolis where I was growing up and in this band up there, I just kind of dabbled. And, and then I, I saw a thing called NSAI in Nashville. It's like, and they threw, uh, threw song camps. They still do twice a year here in Nashville. And so I applied. You had to submit a couple songs and uh, get accepted into their song camp where you sit with four or five hit songwriters for three or four days. And basically it's you know, a camp, but you just kind of spend all day with them and have lunch and just hang with them all day. And they critique your music and they give you the just kind of teach you the craft of writing songs. And through that, I met one of the teachers was James Dean Hicks, who's a hit songwriter. And he pulled me actually out of class one day and, and just asked if I had any more material. So I promptly whipped out a cassette out of my pocket and he said, no, 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 put it away. I don't want, otherwise everybody's going to be handing me their cassettes, but just here's my phone number. Call me when song camp is done. I'll have to come to my office and I'd like to talk to you. And from there, he, he invited me to come back down on more of a regular basis until finally he convinced me to move down on a permanent basis and write as his company. And then I did that for the first couple of years I moved to Nashville and that was like in 1999. 2000, 2001. It was a great learning experience because it kind of enabled me to skip over a lot of the that first one or two hurdles that most new songwriters in Nashville have to jump over. I kind of all of a sudden had uh, entree into this world of really good songwriters, and he had me co-write with his writers on the staff, and he just believed me enough that I uh, that he gave me that opportunity, which is all I was grateful for. And, and I never really had any hits or anything or cuts. I just kind of I still, I guess I didn't take it as seriously as I should have back then. And just through the years, I still, I still write. I, I guess I, I'm more dabble in it than in the serious songwriter. You've recorded and toured with a number of musicians, like Michael Johnson. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the recordings that you've appeared on. You well, know, I played on Michael Johnson's one of his earlier albums. Before he kind of went the country route, he, he moved to Nashville years ago and became a country artist, but before that he had a great career as a, a solo acoustic guitar player. I played on one or two of his albums. I also traveled with him a bit and, and played some shows with him as a second guitarist and learned a lot from him. And before that, right out of high school, I actually moved to California, to Los Angeles from Minneapolis and, and just was in the right place at the right time and, and got a, a gig with a woman named Mary McGregor who had a a song that was climbing the charts at that point. This is like in 1977, 78. And I was, I want to say I was 18, I was 19 years old. Just through circumstance, I got a chance to more or less audition for her band. And she had a song called Torn Between Two Lovers. It, was, it became a number one worldwide hit. And I just got extremely lucky. They were looking for an acoustic guitar player and knew the right people. And I was in. 
and that was like my first real professional gig. And then other than that, I played on just various local albums, whether they're here in Nashville, not any huge national type albums. I did play on Jars of Clay. I became friends of the band, actually in between guitar gigs, as opposed to getting a regular job. When I actually moved to Nashville, I got a job being a merchandise manager, just thinking, well, that'd be a job that would keep me on the road and keep me plugged in and networked throughout the whole country community and pop world. So I I got hired at a merchandise company here in Nashville, and they put me on the road. And one of my first groups I went out with was Jars of Clay, and I worked with them probably for a year, year and a half. But through that, I became good friends with all the band members who were really great guys. And they had me play banjo. It was my first instrument was banjo. I played banjo on one of their recordings. I couldn't tell you which record it is. But, uh, out. And, uh, I played Mary McGregor's albums way back when. And there you go. And probably others that I can't think of right now, but my memory is short on that. You have this album of your own. How did you yes. get the idea to start writing the songs that would appear on Cranberry Red Balloon? Some of the songs I wrote were kind of more geared toward children. I had a daughter, and I think back when she was young, you know, three, four, five years old, I would just kind of write silly little songs for her. And, and out of that, some of these songs grew with it. And James Dean Hicks, the publisher that convinced me to move to Nashville, had heard some of these songs, and he always had said, you should really gather all your children's songs and just do a children's album because they're such cool songs. And I just kind of put it off, and years went by, and, and I just kind of kept dabbling. And some of the songs really aren't, on the record, really aren't children's songs, but they they can be if you put them in that context. You know, they're easily listenable as children's songs. And, and when I actually uh, met my wife, she had heard the songs and she she's the one that was kind of the catalyst to getting me in the studio and she pretty much made me go in the studio and record these songs and that was a couple of years ago and and got a good friend of mine who's a great engineer here in town it's a big country engineer slash producer named Mills Logan and he co-produced the album with me in his home studio and he also engineered it and he brought in he kind of called all of his friends who were all the A-list studio guys here in town and asked if they'd be willing to come in and play on a not like a non-country type of a record and, and all of them said yes you know they'd love to so I got some really good players on it it really turned out great and I get some vocal backgrounds by some friends of mine one including our Garfunkel who I play for now and others are some of the guys in the Beach Boys who I'm friends with again through doing the merchandise thing it was one of the bands I was out for, for quite a while with the Beach Boys and through that I met Bruce Johnson and Mike Love and his son Christian Love and Randall Kirsch and John Cousill who's the drummer and they all ended up playing on the record singing on it for me just as just as being good friends that they were the song that has Bruce Johnston and these other members mm-hmm. of the Beach Boys th- that song is Perfect yep. Day Yes. Tell us about that one. That is a song I co-wrote with a, a friend of mine here in Nashville. We actually wrote it quite a while ago as not a kid song, but that's one of the ones that really ended up being a great kid song because it's just such a positive, lovely song. It's very up and very commercial, very simple, almost kind of has a Beach Boy vibe to it. And that's why I asked Bruce if he'd sing on it along with uh, Christian Love, Mike's son, and Randall Kirsch, who does all the high parts in the band and it really actually turned out great it just uh, was very very happy with the song and they loved it and it's probably the most commercial sounding song on the record i think the other song that i wanted to ask about that's what i like about the rain Mm -hmm. tell me what inspired that one that i think that just that just started out with just a simple little melody but the just a very simple chord. I like the chords against the melody, and I think I just kind of started singing nonsensical words to it, which is kind of how you really write. Just start singing the first thing that comes to mind that's being inspired by the chords that you're playing and just the mood of the day, and maybe it was raining that day or something, and just a very light, kind of a, a fun, dipping in the rain kind of a song. And that's that's how it came about. And that one actually has John Cowsill, who's from the Cowsill band, if you remember them from the 60s, they had a few big hits back then. John Cousill sings on that along with his wife, Vicki Peterson, who's one of the founders of the Bengals. She's the uh, blonde 
guitar player, but she and her sister actually started the Bangles way back when. So they sang on it. I think that's that's how that song came about. It was just me just kind of thinking of anything I could you know, to, get, to get some kind of lyrics down, and that's what came out. It was a song about the rain, which I, I, it's another up-tempo. I tend to write just kind of ballady, kind of moody songs, but Perfect Day, and that's what I like about the rain, and Cranberry Red Balloon, the first song, title song, are, are pretty up songs. So You mentioned Cranberry Red Balloon. That's how the album starts. Mm-hmm. How did you get the idea for those lyrics? It's a great song. Oh, thank you. That actually came, I was staying at a friend's house when I was back in Minneapolis visiting, and they lived on Cranberry Lane, actually, and as wacky as that sounds, but I just, I had this, this kind of this melody with a kind of a banjo-y sounding guitar part that I came up with, and and I was, I think I was just sitting in their living room looking out the window and seeing all the little kids playing out in the yard, and I just wanted to write a song. Originally, just thought I'm going to kind of write a, a Penny Lane kind of a, a song, you know, just images of what I'm looking at. It started out as Cranberry Lane. I don't think I even came up with any lyrics. And just kind of jotted that down. And when I got back to Nashville, I was in the publisher's office just writing away one afternoon and, and just was messing with Cranberry. And I think just Cranberry Red Balloon just came up out of nowhere, just popped up, as we say. And just out of that was the uh, the song was born, just, just kind of. It was actually an easy song to write because it just kind of follows each verse, just kind of follows this kid. And it's also it's also based on a movie that I saw as a little kid called Is it the Balloon or the Red Balloon? It's a French movie with I don't think there's any dialogue in it, but it's a black and white movie, and I think the balloon was red in the movie. And I just remember that movie as a, a young kid. Just for some reason, I just really it stuck with me that that film, and I, that's kind of what I was writing about too. It's just this kid running chasing this cranberry red balloon, just using that as an inspiration as well. And each each verse just kind of goes into the next verse and follows his kid along. And in I think the third or fourth verse, he finally catches the balloon, but realizes now he's caught the balloon, the game is over. You know, it's like, well, now what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to let the balloon go so I can chase it again. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it really kind of parallels about chasing dreams and, and what do you do once you achieve your dream? Well, you've got to keep dreaming and, and chase other things. So it's kind of kind of a metaphor for that, I guess. Very interesting. There's a number of really captivating instrumental songs on there. Tell us about Janer's Dream. Janer's Dream is just, just a little guitar thing I came up with that I really didn't have any lyrics for, so I just kind of developed it as, as an instrumental. It's kind of a catchy, kind of a, a toe-tapper idea was just to have the song build, and it kind of does. And I had when the musicians came in, I told them the idea. I just wanted to kind of just start and just keep building to a huge end. And then it just kind of breaks down to nothing again and goes back into the guitar thing. And uh, and actually, Janer, Janer's dream is actually just a, an old girlfriend that I had back in high school was Jane, and she went by the name nickname Janer. I just kind of wrote it as a dedication to her. She had passed away years ago, and I just was thinking about her, I think, when I was playing it, and I decided to call it Janer's dream just uh, for no other reason. I thought it was kind of a, a nice uh, remembrance of her, just so I could, because I, I think about her through the years, every once in a while, and, uh, and that's kind of how that came about. Earlier, we were talking about Cranberry Red Balloon that has vocals with Art Garfunkel. How did you meet Art Garfunkel? Art, back it up a little bit, when I was still living in Minneapolis, before I moved to Nashville, I think in like 1996 or 1997, I had I was watching TV and there was a, a PBS special ca- called Across America, and it was a special on Art Garfunkel. It was a live concert, I think, from uh, Ellis Island or something like that. And it was Art and his band, with little snippets of him talking with James Taylor and picture, you know, films of him kind of walking because he walked across America and he had just completed his walk across the United States. And to celebrate that, they they filmed this this concert, this live concert of him called it across America. And I remember just watching that and seeing the acoustic guitar player thinking that is my gig. I love that gig. And it was Eric Weisberg who was a great guitar player playing guitar with him. And I just thought that's my gig. I, I would love, cause I always loved our Garfunkel. I had all the solo albums as well as the Simon Garfunkel records. And it was all the Jimmy Webb songs, which I loved and Stephen Bishop songs. And I just loved all that stuff. And I would just sit even into my teens and twenties, just learn all the guitar parts. That's just what I did. So I knew all those songs, and I thought, 
I can do that gig. I want that gig. And I just kind of put it out there in the universe, as wacky as it sounds. And then move ahead several years later, I was living in Nashville, renting a house from a woman. And her fiancé was a guy named Buddy Motlock, who was a singer-songwriter, of uh, a very talented guy. And he's, he was actually working with Art. He and Art and Maya Sharp they were doing a trio album called Everything Waits to Be Noticed. And, and I met Buddy, my landlord's fiancé. It's getting confusing here. And I just met him, and, I, and he told me he's working with Art Garfunkel. I go, oh, wow, that's awesome. I love Art Garfunkel. And I said, if he's ever looking for an acoustic guitar player, if you ever hear of him looking for an acoustic guitar player, I'd love to just give him my name and number and at least put my name in the hat so I could give an audition with him if it ever came up. And, and Buddy didn't really know Art that well at the time. And he said, well, I, I think I think he has his band. He's had him for a while. I think he's happy. And so I said, well, it's okay. It just doesn't hurt to ask. And I think a day or so later, the phone rang and it was Buddy saying, you're not going to believe this, but Art, when I saw him the next time after I talked to you, he said, do you know any acoustic guitar players in Nashville that might be able to do this gig? And, and, and Buddy, who really didn't know me that well, just literally pulled out the piece of paper that I'd written my name and number on. He said, well, yeah, this guy. It's just, it was just weird being in the right place at the right time. He said, okay, well, I'd love to meet him sometime. And I think I met him and just introduced to him. And I think a year late, a year went by. I really didn't see Buddy that much after that. And, and maybe a year later, I ran into Buddy again. And again, I said, well, obviously, wasn't really looking for a guitar player. He said, yeah, he's been touring and everything is cool. I think like two days later, he, I think he asked Buddy again, who was that guitar player I met last year? And boom, I mean, the day a day later, the phone rang. It was art. It was like it was just destiny. And he flew to Nashville and, and I auditioned for him. And he was just he just called out songs. I knew all the songs he called out, which he was kind of impressed by, and just played them. And, and I think two weeks later, I was in Europe doing our Garfunkel shows. It was just that wacky. Wow. What does yeah. he like to work with? Uh, he is very, very serious about what he does. Even after all these years, he takes it very serious. He's a super nice guy. He's a, he's, he's a real pro. You know, you got to be on your toes. <laughs> he's, he, and he's always tweaking the show, but he's, he's one of those guys that you just look at and go, wow, this, this guy is pretty amazing. I mean, he just, he, uh, he's such a perfectionist. He's always working on the show, and he sings. Each show is like he's singing Scarborough Fair for the first time. You know, he's just he's that in tune of how how he presents it. You know, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's, he just sings it like it's the first time he's sung in front of people. He, you know, he doesn't get tired of the songs. It's interesting to see, and it's a uh, it keeps me on my toes as far as not getting lazy about it, and just kind of getting settled in and just kind of playing the routine parts because that I've done you know, 50 times before, you can't do that. You've got to play it just like he does. Like this is the first and last time you're going to play the song, you know, that kind of a thing. When you're performing with him, is there a song of his from his catalog that is a favorite of yours to perform? I think I love to play the, the classics because as soon as you start, all those Paul Simon guitar parts are so familiar to everybody. They're just as famous as the, the lyrics and the title of the song. As soon as you go, start into the boxer, people just like, you just hear the swell from the audience. It's like, wow, here it is, the boxer. And that's, that's always fun to hear. Same with Scarborough Fair. It's just the intro lines are so identifiable. And such trademark sounds. It's just fun to play them. Just hear the audience, like, just like, oh, wow, here it is. And then there's a really pretty song that he does off of his Everything Waits to Be Noticed album called Perfect Moment that he wrote. He doesn't write a lot of songs. He writes a lot of poetry. But he, this is a song that he co wrote from that project that I was talking about with Buddy Montlock and, and Maya Sharp called Everything Wants to Be Noticed. But the perfect moment is just, I think, because he wrote it, he sings it so well because it's, it's from him and it's hard to actually from a poem that he started and uh, Maya and, and then, uh, I think Buddy and some other writers and Art finished the song. So it's a very personal song to Art. That's very fun to play because it's such a beautiful, liquidy sounding song, both lyrically and the guitar part. and just one of those songs that always works. We just we're, there's there's several songs in the show that he and I are just locked in on. They're always going to sound great, even in, in the most adverse conditions. You know, we know that when we get to that song, we're going to be able to sell it. And it's like I said, there's a few songs like that. Scarborough Fair is like that. Perfect moment, I think, for Emily. Whenever I may find her, I think the name of it is another one of those. But just we always just kind of hit a home run with it. When somebody is hearing your music, whether they're listening to an album that you appeared on, your own album, or 
hearing you live. What do you want people to get from that experience? Ah, uh, wow. I guess I just want them to know that I, I put in a lot of work. <laughs> you know, I take it very seriously. Even, you know, I'm in my, I'll say mid to late 50s right now. I still just find the joy in playing guitar. And just I still just get up in the morning and go into my room where all my guitars are. And I just love taking my guitar out first thing in the morning and playing it. You know, it just still has that magic thing to it. And just the joy of, of hearing just a nice guitar, you know, and just playing chords and just hearing it ring. And and the same with the music, you know, I just, uh, just if I can get that across and people hear that, then I'm I'm happy, you know, because it's just, it's just kind of who I am. And just what I've done all my life since I was, I guess, 11 or 12 when I started playing guitar, you know, just it's so, so ingrained in what I do and who I am. Just uh, if that comes across, then I'm happy. What is the best thing about being Tab Levin? Well, being married to my wife, Annie, <laughs> of course, and just being able to do what I love to do, and that's being on the road and playing music and, and making money doing it and being able to record CDs when I have enough songs together, which I'm kind of working on now. Again, I'm just starting to write again to get the second one out. And uh, I think being able to, to work with art and being in his world, you know, it's a whole different world and that thing, you know, I leave Nashville. It's always kind of weird. I leave Nashville and go into his whole other life. And it's, it's, it's that his life, you know, it's, it's a whole different world than what uh, I'm used to. And probably most people are used to, you know, just, it's fun. You get to go to great countries. We're going to England here in, in a few weeks going to Japan for a few weeks in December. And I think he's talking about doing a European tour next spring and you know, hit all the major cities and countries over there and, and just playing in just nice venues and, and just meeting really nice, cool people, just fans that come up and guitar players always come up and want to know the kind of guitar I play and what kind of pickup I use. And that's, that's kind of the fun stuff to me is to be able to share that because that's, that's me too. I, I do that when I, a guitar player. I want to know what he's what, what he's using. What do you want to say to anyone who hears this interview? Totally open ended. To uh, just follow your follow your gut and trust your heart. And, and if, you, if you can dream it, you can do it. It's, I didn't make that up, of course. But you know, I just I just always believed I'd be able to make a living playing guitar. I've always managed to. And it just it, it comes from hard work. It's a lot of you got to put a lot of hard work into what it is you want to do and, and to make it happen. But once it happens, it, you, it, it, it's that's the fun stuff. You know, it's when you're doing what you love to do, and it doesn't get boring as long as it's you know it's what you want to do. I guess. Who is Tab Laban? Who is Tab Laban? Wow, that's a scary. You, I don't think you want to know. Like, <laughs> oh, uh, just a nice guy that's out here trying to do what he loves. So, who is Tab Laban? I, I've never been asked that. You got put me on the spot here. Just a, a guy that loves life, you know, and is having a good time. Thank you very much for doing this interview. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I have enjoyed that album very oh, thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, sorry we didn't connect at Atlanta show. Got a little, <laughs> you know, a little weird at the end there with the, the crowd and all that, and my wife was there, and, and uh, it just I was really looking forward to meeting you face to face, but we will. We'll be back in Atlanta at some point, so I'll get to maybe have lunch with you or something next time. Oh, that'd be great. I'd like that. We'll plan on it. Okay, Tab. Well thank you very much. And have a good one. All right, thank you. You too. I appreciate it, Paul.